Hey, it's Craig Syracuse and welcome to another episode of Walk in Faith, the show where we go beyond the image and we discover who our guests really are. You might know them from TV, the big screen, or even the world of sports, but do we really know who they are as a person? Do we know what motivates them? Do we know what inspires them? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Join me now as I sit down with Taylor James and Lindsay Wagner from the new biblical movie, Samson. Thank you so much for this opportunity. You know, I think you guys have a lot in common. You both play these extraordinary characters with such power and strength. But before we go into it, can you just let our viewers know, I don't know if a lot of them are familiar with the story of Samson and the vows that he took with uh, God. So the story of Samson is he was chosen by God. He was given to parents who couldn't have a child. And he had a path that was bestowed upon him to free his people from oppression. As part of his vows being a Nazarite, he could not touch the dead, he could not drink from the wine, and he could not cut his hair. So we pick up the story with Samson, he's uh, a young teenager, quite impulsive, making a few foolish decisions, you know, maybe his wants and desires are chasing girls and probably not what they should be. And through the course of the 20 years, we, we watch him grow up, we watch him go through these mistakes and, and learn from these experiences and ultimately have the moment of redemption where he can finally give himself to God finally do what he's been chosen to do, and that is to ultimate sacrifice. Uh, he kills himself and frees his people in the process. Now, were you familiar with the story? I was familiar of the story of Samson to a kind of Sunday school level. I went uh, to Sunday school as a child and then attended church, and then quite similar to Samson, I maybe <laughs> started chasing girls and playing sport a little bit too much. <laughs> Hopefully no dead bodies. No, no, no dead bodies. In, in my teenage years, the wonderful morals and ethics that you learn from religion and from my parents stayed with me into my adult life. So I knew the story on a surface level. So it was, it was so fun to dive back into the material and see how many iconic moments there are throughout his story, which pertaining to film is fantastic. And, and I can understand why it's the time for Samson to be made into, uh, into a film, because it's so rich in, in visuals and in morals and, and messages. My name is Samson. And now how did this come about? And then how do you prepare for this role? Like, I mean, it was such a physical role, an emotional role. How do you prepare for this? For the physical side of things, I, I had a vision many years ago that I wanted to play this type of character. Not necessarily Samson, but someone of power, of physical strength. So for me, I decided to grow my hair. It was a two year process. It was very short, similar to yours, Craig. And, um, and I decided to grow it, and I decided to not be shy about physical upkeep. In, in England, we have this thing called tall poppy syndrome, where we like to cut people back down, and we all kind of are on a level. In America, we like to celebrate people and their success and their hard work. And, and I love England to pieces, but I decided I wasn't going to conform to that idea, and I wanted to do what I felt was right. So I started to really look after my health and fitness. I fast every day between 18, 22, 23 hours. And then I put myself through a pretty rigorous uh, workout in the gym, uh, weights, uh, predominantly resistance training, and then I feast. It may be one meal, it could be two, it could be three. And every day's different. Some days it's an 18 hour fast, yesterday was a 25 hour fast, today could be a, uh, another 23, 24. And it just kept me as lean as possible, which relating to, to Samson is, his story, the people, they're starving in the story. So it's not fair that Samson's huge. It's, if he's walking around like an NFL player and everybody else is emaciated, it's not fair to the character, number one. Number two, if he gets his strength from his biceps, you know, and he's, and he's a big old NFL player, it's too obvious. But if his strength comes from God and people have to question where he gets that strength because of his lean disposition, then that, for me, really struck a chord. So the path that Taylor was on wasn't too dissimilar. So it wasn't difficult to physically get into the shape for Samson because I had done that over the three, four years building up. And as far as an emotional level, um, it's simply you just tap into the, the story. You see the arc and you, and you see the, 
the key moments and the catalysts and, and we just do our job as actors and that's where we connect. That was a great point. You know, I, that was something that did strike me because I was looking at your physique and I said, I wonder why he didn't put on extra pounds. I didn't notice that. That's a great point. And like you said, you were able to connect with the character emotionally because you've half-fasted so you know what sort of the Israelites went through Correct. where they didn't always get a meal. That's a great point. I didn't see that in the film. And now, Lindsay, you've had a career, I mean, that spanned for over 40 years. I mean, you've played such amazing characters and you tackled such important roles, whether it was terrorism or breast cancer, and now playing the mother to Samson, a man that, you know, rescues the Israelites from the, the Philistines. What was that like and how did you prepare for this role? Well, I, I say my life prepared me for this role because I'm the mother of two sons and uh, Zelophonis has two sons, the Samson and the younger brother, and my sons are stuntmen. So when they go out into the world, they're going out in a bit of potential danger. And so all of the emotions, that's the thing about this story, what I love about it and what Taylor was, was referring to, that it's not just a physical superpower guy story. It's a really human story. And mom's journey is very human. It's, it's really not much different than me other than we weren't starving. But emotional things, when Samson's going through these emotional things, very easy to draw on when my sons were going through emotional pain for one reason or another. And, uh, you know, the physical peril that Samson was in every time he would leave our village. I never knew if I was going to see him again. And, you know, certainly one, like police, stuntmen's wives, and all because, you know, when people live those kinds of lives, you, you have to develop a certain way of coping with the potential loss that appears to be greater than most people's journey when your loved one leaves the home. So, you know, I, I had a lot to draw from uh, on that. Yeah, that was something to the character being the mother to Samson. You know, she had to sort of accept that, you know, God was calling him and he had to sacrifice his own life. One of the things I love about this film is that it's the emotional journey that Taylor was describing is, for me, a metaphor. This is one of the things that I loved about the movie, why I responded mm -hmm. to it. It's a metaphor for what we all go through of the temptations of life, of the needing to grow up, and especially for people who have a faith in whatever it is, that higher power, to know that sometimes we do have that struggle between our, our um, egoic and or physical desires versus what we think is right and wrong. I mean, that's what I love about this story. It's not just that he's this super power guy that was gone around able to punch everybody out and get the girl back or get the you know kid back or the whatever. It's a real journey of dealing with one's own demons. Mm -hmm. And we all go through that. So Samson's story, whether you're a man or a woman or a youth or a whatever, we can all relate to his journey. And by the end of it, of course, he finds his center and he finds his openness and sees his mistake. And it takes responsibility for it and says, I get it, I did this. You know, and at which point, when you accept who you are and who you've been, when that happens and you find real acceptance and self-forgiveness, you open up and spirit just comes through you. My name is Samson, and I serve the living God. And you have proven nothing. In the film, the Israelites sort of questioned their faith, and I think at a point, I feel like Samson also sort of questioned God when he was calling for him, and he didn't respond immediately. Have you ever questioned your faith, similar to your characters? In my own personal journey, yes. Um, I think everybody has faith. You have to have faith in something at some point, and I do feel that everybody questions it. I question my faith probably every single day, probably a hundred times a day. I have lots of satellite voices that go around my head, and they just constantly <clears throat> doubt me. And it is fear, and it is reluctancy. And Samson is the most reluctant hero I have ever come across. And that was the one thing that I could connect with on an emotional level, which for me was the defining thing between this being a action film and people just seeing some meathead on the screen as a two-dimensional character. It was the moment in which the audience suddenly the chord gets created between the audience and the character. And that empathy chord 
allows you to see Samson no longer as a failure, no longer as the mess up within the Bible. They see him as someone who's reluctant, someone who has fear, someone who questions their faith continually, as we all do as humans. So whether Taylor does it on a hundred times a day or whether Samson did it a hundred times a day as well, it's just a, uh, it highlights and illustrates how similar his journey is to all of us, male, female, young, old. We all get trapped by fear. We also have a curiosity not to walk the path that is bestowed upon us. Hey kid, don't touch that red button. Mm, I really want to touch the red button. You've got to do this. Oh, I don't want to do that. It's, it's, it's life. And that's where we can learn the message from, that we watch Samson and we see the journey that he goes through. We see his mum's journey. We see his father's journey. We see how it impacts all these people. And we should learn from that. Because if we don't, we just go around, it's Groundhog Day, day in, day out. And as an artist, we have a responsibility to tell these stories, these iconic stories that have the message, that have the value, that we can learn from. You can get entertained, don't get me wrong, but you should also see the inner message, that subtext. And I feel the questioning of faith that Samson goes through and the questioning of faith that I go through, uh, very similar. And his redemption and Steve Jobs' success and Michael Jordan's success and all these other people who have faced fear and failure time and time again and they succeed or they learn something from it, we too as people have that opportunity. I agree. And, and it was interesting too how God was sort of communicating with him and always placing these things in his heart. But sometimes as, as you know, humans, and it's difficult to know or distinguish God's voice, right? And like, how did Samson know that it was actually God speaking to him and not his own sort of desires? How did he know and how do we know as, as people, as humans? I feel the way we as artists and screenwriters and directors, we were telling the story, the, the ship that we decided to sail. Um, was that Samson is reminded constantly by his parents that he was chosen, that this is the path that's bestowed upon him. The expectation from his uh, family, his villagers, the oppression that surrounded them continually was a reminder that life isn't good right now, you need to do something about it, you were chosen. But again, you, you say that to a teenager, do this, do this, do this, the chances are they don't want to do it. Also the, the initial message was given to mom prior to even the pre you know the pregnancy being real she's the one that received the voice and then the physical manifestation of the child it was very clear so i think in this case mom had a very a much stronger connection and understanding and visceral understanding of what that feels like and sounds like when you know god was talking to her and as you were just saying all of that was put on him he didn't hear it initially himself. It Correct. wasn't told directly from God. He was told from everybody else. So imagine, and he's only human. I mean, he's human. He just had a special connection that he had not found for himself yet. And so that's a very tough dilemma. It's like, I mean, I suppose it's like royalty, you know? You're born a king. Okay, you're, gonna, you're the heir. I am. You know, it's like your whole life. Again, you're, to you're told yeah. this is what you should do. So I feel when you're told something, until you accept it emotionally and physically, spiritually, it mentally, and, and experience it for yourself, you, you question it. So when Samson has an opportunity throughout his journey to, to hear God's calling, that's where he starts to form his own opinions. And, okay, maybe I can do this. And we chart Samson after the loss of his father and after the, the thousand Philistine fight where he, and he's now much older, and he wants peace, true peace. He doesn't want to fight anymore. His younger brother is still trying to rally up and, and says, you can beat them, you can physically dominate them, you're the strongest man ever. And he doesn't want that. He just wants to resolve with peace and, and to live in that easy state. And I suppose it's right at the end where Samson is blinded He's failed again, and he has lost his family and lost all the respect of his people. And as I said at the top, where he has the chance for ultimate redemption, he sees the clearest. And that's when he says, God, you have called upon me since birth, um, you, and now I listen. Tell me, wh what would you have me do? And there's a slight flicker of, of hope and, and connection with faith that I chose to portray to the audience where he is on his knees and he's looking to God and he asks that moment. And there's an ever so slight smile that just comes through the destruction that's on his face then. And that is because 
he hears what he needs to do. Samson was willing to sacrifice his life to save his people. And I think about that, and we, and we probably all think about that. Would I be willing to do that? Whether God could have called me or not, do I have that strength to sacrifice my own life for strangers or for, for the Israelites? Have you ever thought about that? I'm a very honest person, so I, I don't mind the world laughing at me. But yes, I, I have thought about that a lot. And I made a decision that if I be blessed in, in this journey of my life to be able to tell stories and to work in, a, in an environment that I want to work with, people that I want to work with, that I have to give something back. And, and I decided to give myself completely and I decided to forego a lot of things. Um, now, there could be the, the top surface level things like partying and going out and discipline and maintenance, but it trickled down into a lot of areas in my life, which I, I shan't get too personal on, but I'm, I'm single, I don't have a home, I don't have a massive network of friends. I have a very small core of people and I feel that my one journey in this world is to tell stories, to help inspire people to live a better life, to be the best version of themselves that they can possibly be. So that kind of sacrifice that you talk about, I cannot, you know, put myself up on a cross or push pillars or things like that. We live in a different world and I'm not saying that at all, but I would like to sacrifice a lot of luxuries and benefits and, and other easier things in life to help other people by telling stories. And I think you are. I mean, you're using this platform. I mean, you're just, just the way you spoke a few uh, questions ago about uh, fear. I mean, those words that you use or you chose were very inspirational. That's important, to use this platform for the greater glory or for, the, for God or for just to inspire people, opposed to doing other things that were using the platform in a negative. So I think you are doing that, and I've only known you for 20 minutes. So. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> and, 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 I'm, and I'm only just starting. I've, I've spent 10 years in in training with working with the wonderful people. There was a line in the film I wanted to ask you, why does God hold what we desire? What does that line mean to you? Have you ever thought about that? I'm gonna flip it to you actually, Craig, because this is what art should do. It should be open to people's interpretation. I go to a gallery, I look at a mm -hmm. painting on a wall, oh, wow, that reminds me of X, Y, Z, and you go up and you see something completely different. And it's the emotional chord that you have with the piece of art or with the actor or with the music that is, for me, so important because it lives with you forever. We put a seed, we put it inside you and it grows. And that hopeful growth of the tree could be a better Craig, a better Lindsay, a better Taylor. So uh, not to get out of it, but let's hear your interpretation. Pretty much God, I think God has a plan for all of our lives, right? And he sort of lets us know a little bit as we go along. So he's sort of what we desire, what we truly desire in life is sort of part of God's plan. So like whatever, if your true desire is to motivate, inspire people, he knows that. And he sort of lets us know little by little, but sometimes it's difficult because we want it to say happen a little bit quicker than God's plan, right? So we, we sort of question at some point and say, God, you know, you know what I want. You put this in my heart. Why is it so difficult? Why is it taking so long? But that's the process. We need to learn along the process. So when I heard that, I said, it's the same thing with me. I, God knows what I want, right? He put it here. But it's such a process. It's slow. So you start to question, God, you put this here. You, you know what my desires are. Why is it taking so long? Sort of that's what I took from it. I think that's spot on because I, that resonates with me as well. And I, and I think why that line stuck out the most, in my interpretation of you from what I know now, is that you like to challenge yourself and you like to work really hard and you don't want to know it too easy. So you, you hear, why do you hold what we desire? Why do you hold back? Because you have a love-hate relationship with that. You wouldn't operate and perform the way you do as a human if it was given to you so easily, but it frustrates you. Mm -hmm. And the questioning and the self-doubt, you sometimes just want that reassuring hand and it's the same as the footprints in the sand that the the two the, the set of footprints walking down the beach and he turns to Jesus and says in in my trials of uh, tribulation and when and difficult times in my life I could only see one set of footprints why did you abandon me and he says that's when I carried you my child and I feel that that reassuring hand that you're looking for is always there you just probably can't see it What do you think your true purpose in life is? I know you, you mentioned about inspiring people. What do you truly think it is? What do you think God's plan is, as I like to say? It's to tell stories on multiple mediums and through different channels. I can play the piano. I have a, a catalog of songs from soundtracks of films, scores. Again, it's to do with telling stories, writing music which inspires. I have a talent for writing as well. 
I have a ferocious appetite for reading scripts. I love seeing stories. I love to act. I also love to direct. I want to know about producing. I'm always bugging the press and the media. Tell me about this. I want to learn every single facet of it so that at the end of my career I have amassed this all-being purpose that is about the realm of storytelling. So for me, that is it. I'm a child who managed to be the only kid at school to not do drama. I hated it. Wow. I wanted to be a pilot. Wow. I was pilot. so scared. My brother used to speak for me all the time. I still get petrified going to talking to girls or standing up on a stage or doing things. And there's so many things that I'm so shy and not the performer. But when it connects with telling a story and inspiring somebody, I, I suddenly feel at peace and I feel relaxed. And for something that eluded me for so long and worried me about how I would ever be in, in, on stage or on screen, the, the fear doesn't stop me or anymore because I know it's my purpose. So my purpose on life, I, I believe, is, is to inspire people through storytelling. I love that answer. Lindsay, I read something. So I read that you sort of had this intuition or vision that sort of saved your life. I mean, was it, was that, can you tell the story? My mother and I were traveling back from, was it Chicago, to Los Angeles, and we were booked on this one flight. And while we were standing in line with our boarding pass in hand, we got almost to the point where we were going to get on the plane, and I started to freak out. <laughs> I was like, we have to do something different. And I was like, we shouldn't be going this way. We should be going another way. And I was, you know, what I've learned, because I am rather intuitive, um, I learned more and more about it over the years. Sometimes you just have to trust the feeling or the instinct, which is what I was doing, because the mind's going to try and explain it. But it was something so inexplicable out here. It didn't come to me like, oh, this plane is about to crash. Don't get on it. Go somewhere else. It was just, I can't get on that plane. So I was being communicated with by God, by the angels, by whatever, you know, however one would interpret that. And all of a sudden my mind, my mind says, um, I, I, we should go get my sister, because my sister was meeting us in Los Angeles and she was leaving from Portland, Oregon. I said, we should go get my sister and fly home with, with, with Randy and, and go home with her. And she said, well, she's 18 now, she can fly by herself. And I said, no, I think we should really go get Randy. <laughs> and thinking about it logically, she was perfectly capable of making that flight by herself, but I just had this feeling. Instead of today, I would just go, there's something, I believe my gut, I'm being given a message of some kind. It doesn't matter what it, what it is, let's figure out what we're gonna do differently. Today I wouldn't question it, but then I had to have a reason, you know, uh, that, that was logical. So we went back and changed our tickets, flew to Portland, Oregon. When we landed in Portland and called my sister and she said, oh my gosh, she was freaking out. She says, you're alive? And I said, what do you mean we're alive? We didn't know anything about it because we were in the air when that other plane took off and then and crashed, so we didn't know. And everybody in Los Angeles who was expecting us was freaking out, thought we were still on that plane. So it was quite shocking for everybody. <laughs> and uh, we got on the plane with her and flew back to California. At which point I really started listening much more seriously to that which I had experienced many times in the past and giving it so much more credit. I did not that I wrote it off before because I really knew that that was a reality kind of thing. But I guess I stopped having to have a reason anymore. So this is real, accept it. It's out of what you've always been taught and just just deal with it and consider you're, you're blessed to have this kind of openness. The next day or weeks later to know that, I mean, you, you could have died. I mean, the plane crashed. Was it easy to process or how did you, did you start to question God, why me or why did this happen or? I didn't end up with survivor's guilt if that's what you mean. Mm -hmm. I felt very, blessed. It's not that I never have the experience of the fear of death, but I feel, I think maybe I'm more in touch with the reality and it's easier for me to hang on to the reality that this is a life cycle we're in. I don't have so much of a, a fear of death as a lot of people do. I feel, as we've been discussing today regarding Samson, I feel that God um, has such unconditional love it is, it is unconditional love. And no matter how bad I've been, I know the stories of you do this and you're gonna go to hell. Yeah, okay. Um, maybe that's true, maybe it's not. I just know that when I get myself centered, I feel such love from God that I, I'm gonna end up wherever I'm gonna end up. So that's not my fear. I guess if I have a fear of death, it's, it's about leaving my kids. Yeah. 
you know, no, I can't do a thing about what happens to them anymore. They're, you know, 31 and 35, and <laughs> the thought of leaving my kids, I'm not in the world to fix something if I can or help. I, I think that's probably the hardest thing when I think about leaving or my sister or my mother. You know, that's, that's my issues around the fear of, of death at all. What's next for you guys? What do you have coming up? There's a couple of projects which are very action-based. One's film and one will be a new TV series. The one with The Rock, as you mentioned earlier. <laughs> that would be great. Someone <laughs> alluded to that the other day. There's a, isn't it Samson versus Hercules? It's a famous story uh, that's been done as a movie and someone mentioned maybe you should bring Hercules with The Rock and Samson out. That would be fun. <laughs> but um, uh, there is a, there's a film which I'd really like to be involved in and also a TV series which would run and run. So my agent is working tirelessly to talk with teams about that. It's very early stages. Good, good for you. And anything uh, you want to share? I know you do a lot more than acting. I'm actually, uh, well, you were talking about my, the workshops and retreats that I give because that's part of my life's purpose, I know, is, is this passion of helping people experience their greater potential uh, on whether it's spiritual crisis or physical health or better marriage, whatever, it's those, those things that plague us and they're most based, mostly based in fear, almost everything's based in fear. So I do the, physically, the, virtually the same thing through film or through workshops directly or you know, whatever, teaching people techniques that help with that. I've just, again, I'm feeling this pull in my gut, in my uh, communication center here to <laughs> the greater beyond and it's pulling me back into the industry and I, there's some films I'd like to get made. So my sons have been writing and creating films uh, as well as um, that one son is gonna be directing and my other son's been doing a lot of writing. And there's a couple of things I'd like to get done for myself as well. Oh, that's great. It'd be nice to work as a family unit here oh, on the project. That's so much fun. That's wonderful. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate this opportunity to sit with you. Good thank luck you, with Chris. the film and I'll probably see you guys again. Thank, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Always remember you have the ability to inspire and evangelize through your words and actions. Thanks for walking with us. See you next time.